Lord, as we come before your word, Lord, we ask that you would calm our hearts, focus our attention, help us to receive your word for what it is, the very words of God. Lord, I pray that I would not be a distraction, that I would not say things contrary to your word, but rather I would be a herald of the glorious truth here revealed. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners by means of his death and resurrection. Often we think of the cross. We know that Jesus died for our sins. But it's right for us all to recognize that we need that empty tomb. We need the resurrection. It's actually not enough that Jesus died. He needed to rise. This is the gospel. This is the good news we proclaim. It's the very heart of Christianity. And this morning, I want us to to zoom in and focus on the resurrection and consider why was it necessary? This is Paul's theme in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to focus on verses 17 to 23, but I'm going to give us some introduction at the beginning of the chapter. So here's how Paul begins 1 Corinthians 15. Hear now the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, infallible word. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. See, Paul says it's absolutely foundational to the Christian faith that Jesus rose from the dead. His resurrection is of first importance. Well, why is it such a big deal? Why does it matter so much? Well, skip down to verse 17. Listen to what Paul says. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. He says that this really matters. This is huge. And there he has just given us three reasons why the resurrection is so significant. It confirms our faith, our forgiveness, and our future resurrection. Notice again, look at verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, this is just a hypothetical. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. It's, it's pointless. It's no, of no value. It's, it's in vain. It's useless to believe in the Savior. And he gives us a second reason. If Christ has not been raised, we've not been forgiven from our sins. Look at the end of verse 17. He says, you are still in your sins. Here's the whole verse. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins sins. And then notice third reason. If Christ has not been raised, we have no hope of life after death. So verse 18, if Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now let's pause and make sure we understand what he's saying here. When he speaks of those who have fallen asleep in Christ, he's talking about Christians who have died. Over and over again, the scripture refers to death as falling asleep. Why would it do such a thing? Is that just trying to be nice? No, it's because the scripture promises us resurrection. Those who fall asleep in Christ, those who die, they will awake. They will be resurrected. But that's only true if Christ is risen from the dead. And so he says, if Christ isn't risen, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He continues, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, 
We are of all people most to be pitied. See, Christians, they're willing to suffer and, and to, to give of themselves, to allow themselves to be poured out in this life because we know of the life that is to come. We have hope beyond the grave, beyond death. I want us to consider these three implications of the resurrection this morning. I want us to delight in the reality that because he has risen, these things are true. So here's the first one. Because Christ is risen, our faith is sure. Because Christ is risen, our faith is sure. You see, we can be confident in Jesus. We can trust his every promise, his every word, because he's risen from the dead. You see, his resurrection confirmed his identity. It proved that he really is who he said he was. The source of life itself. Jesus made some pretty bold claims. More bold than any other human had ever said. Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. The one who satisfies. Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, the life. That no one comes to the Father except through him. Just before he raised Lazarus from the dead, in John 11, he said these words, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Just think of what he's saying there. Jesus is claiming that he has power over death, and more than that, he has the authority to give life. And then a few minutes later, he proved it by calling a dead man out of his tomb back to life. But even more so, he proved it in that death could not conquer him. He, he could not be held by death. Death didn't have the power to hold on to the Savior. He rose from the dead. Jesus claimed, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's so bold to say, if you trust me, if you believe in me, you will have life after you die. Well, not everybody was convinced, especially the religious elite of the day. They came to him and they asked him to prove it. They said, give us a sign that will authenticate your authority. Show us you really can keep your word. This is how Jesus responded. This is in Matthew 12, verse 39. Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So what is the sign of Jonah? Well, he continues, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus says, you want a sign? I will give you a sign, one sign. Here's the sign that I am who I say I am. I will rise from the dead. Repeatedly, Jesus predicted both his death and his resurrection, and he did so with specificity. He, he, he specified the timing of his resurrection. Listen to Luke 9, verse 22. Jesus, referring to himself, says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now just think of it. If Jesus could pull that off, if he could predict that other people would kill him and three days later he would rise, I think that would prove that we could actually trust what this man says. That, that what he's Doing and claiming is, is legit. It would confirm his teaching. But of course, think about the opposite. If he failed to do what he predicted, what he said was going to certainly happen, well, then it proves that he was wrong. That he was mistaken. Here's one more such promise. This is John 10, verse 17. Jesus says, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus is saying when these people will murder him, he's actually volunteering for that to take place. He's giving his life, and yet he has the power to take it back. 
So I just want us to, to, to catch a hold of both what Paul is saying in our passage and, and the, the bigger teaching of Christianity. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then he's a liar. He's a false teacher, and you should not listen to anything he says. There's none of this business about, oh yeah, Jesus was a good teacher, but he's not who he said he was. He's not divine. He didn't rise from the dead. No, no, no. It's a package deal. It all goes together. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our trust in him is vain. We should have zero confidence in him. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we have no hope. We're all going to hell. But look at verse 20. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is risen. Indeed, he has. This changes everything. When Jesus rose from the dead, it proved what he was saying. It validated his words The resurrection of Christ means that our trust in him is well-founded, that our faith is warranted. His rising from the dead means our faith is sure. Secondly, because Christ is risen from the dead, our forgiveness is sure. Not just our faith, but our forgiveness of our sin. We are no longer in our sins. We've been justified. We've been declared righteous. This is what Paul is saying was of first importance back at the beginning of the chapter. So back in verse three, I'll read it again. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So both Jesus' death and resurrection was for our sins. It was because we had screwed up. If you examine yourself and you're honest with yourself, you know you haven't met God's standard. You're not perfect. No, you too are a sinner. This is how the prophet Isaiah puts it in chapter 53. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. All of mankind has acted as if they know better than God and gone their own way, done their own thing. We all are rebels against God. Each one of us, a lawbreaker, disobedient to the commands of the Lord. Or or to put it differently, you're not a good person. None of us are. We are bad people. I mean, we're good at being bad. I mean, this is our nature from birth. We want to do things our way, and and we rebel I mean, you don't have to teach a little kid to say no. They just know it (laughs) already, right? Each one of us has rebelled against God. And God, he's the king of the universe. He's the Lord of lords, the king of kings. Our rebellion against him is nothing less than cosmic treason, which means what we deserve is the death penalty. In the book of Romans, Paul puts it this way, Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. What we earn for our sinning against God is the death penalty. That's what we deserve. But God in his mercy sent Jesus, who not only lived a perfect life, but then died a substitutionary death. He took the death that you and I deserved. He died in our place. That's what Paul's celebrating here as of first importance. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What that phrase means is he died just as it had been prophesied, just as the Bible had said it would come to pass. Again, I'll just keep quoting from Isaiah 53. In verse 5, Isaiah writes this. Of Jesus, 700 years before his crucifixion, He writes in past tense, confirming it's as good as done already. He says, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. So he suffered. He was pierced. He was nailed to the cross, not because he deserved it, but because we deserved it. He died in our place, according to the scriptures. 
Even his burial was according to the scriptures. So Isaiah continues, verse 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet with a rich man in his death. What could he possibly be describing there other than what actually took place? Jesus crucified with two other criminals. Their bodies would have been taken down and thrown into a common grave. And yet a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, he he called and asked for permission to take the body of Jesus and put it into a new tomb that he had purchased. And so it was. And even his resurrection was according to the scriptures. Again, back in 1 Corinthians, verse 4, he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with, with the scriptures. So apparently even the timing of the resurrection was according to the scriptures. We'll come back to that in a moment. What we see here on full display is that Christ's resurrection confirms our forgiveness, our justification, our being declared righteous, our salvation. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was like God's stamp of approval. Indeed, Jesus has paid the full price. Our sins have been atoned for. The wrath that our sin deserves has been completely satisfied. Christ's resurrection confirms our faith is sure and that our forgiveness is sure. But thirdly and finally, because Christ is risen, our future resurrection is sure. Because he rose we too will rise. His resurrection gives us hope for our resurrection, confidence that we will indeed experience life after death. We have the certain hope of resurrection life. We know that all Christians, they will rise to live again. This really seems to be Paul's main point. Look again at verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then has his coming those who belong to Christ. So, because of Christ's resurrection, the curse brought about by Adam is reversed. It's, it's turned all around. Instead of death, we receive life. Instead of condemnation, we receive justification. I want us to notice the comparison that's being made. Go back to verse 21 again. For as by a man came death, By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. So we've we've got one person caused death to happen, and the other person caused death to lose its power. Who are these two people? He tells us in the next verse, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam was the first man. He was the representative of all mankind. And as our representative, he failed, just as we would have. But Christ, our new representative, he succeeded. And so in him, there's life from the dead. In Adam, we die. In Christ, we live. Because he was raised, we too will be raised. Because of his resurrection, Christians will likewise experience a resurrection like his. And more than that, Paul uses interesting language here. He says that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of our resurrection. Did you notice that word? It was there in verse 20 and 23. Look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This word first fruits is is laden with meaning. It, It points us back to an Old Testament festival that God established. You see, in the Old Testament, God gave seven holy days, seven of these annual festivals to his people. They all celebrated how God had delivered them, how God had provided for them. But they also all pointed forward to the coming Messiah who would bring about their ultimate rescue. 
One of those festivals is called first fruits. It's what Paul's talking about here. I'm going to read a little bit from Leviticus 23. Verse 4, we read this. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which, the, which you shall proclaim at the appointed time for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. That would have just happened this week. On the 15th day, that's the next day, of that same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So, so we've got these holidays right on top of one another. We've got Passover, and then there's unleavened bread that starts the next day and lasts for a week. Thursday night, we had a Passover dinner. We celebrated that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Last Sunday, we talked about the week of unleavened bread, how it's fulfilled in Christ as he's the, the perfect bread that came down from heaven. Him being unleavened refers to his sinless nature. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are now cleansed of sin. Now we are made unleavened. So Christ certainly is the fulfillment of Passover and unleavened bread. But there's yet a third festival, and it comes the same week. So let's keep reading from Leviticus. I'm in verse 9 now. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel. And say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, and you reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Let's pause there for a moment. Let's understand what's going on here. In the springtime, there's the barley harvest. And the command is, when it's time for the harvest, you go out there with your sickle and you, you get the first bundle of the grain and you bring it and you, you offer it to God. This is the first fruits of the harvest. You, you wave this before the Lord and it's this way of acknowledging that the whole harvest that we're about to get, it all comes from you. You are the provider. You are the one who has given this. You see, God had promised them the promised land. He says, now when you come into the promised land, every year when you reap the harvest, remember I gave this to you. And did you notice when they're supposed to do this? It's, it's a prescribed time. I'll read it again. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So you've got Passover, the week of unleavened bread. In the middle of the week of unleavened bread, the day after the Sabbath. Sabbath, by the way, is Saturday. So what's the day after the Sabbath? It's Sunday. So on the Sunday of that week, they're supposed to bring this offering of the first fruits to the Lord. Here's the end of the text from Leviticus. You shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched nor fresh, until that same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout all your generations, in all your dwellings. So you don't touch the harvest until you've made this offering to the Lord. We see that Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover and unleavened bread, but how is he the fulfillment of this festival of First fruits. Well, three days after his crucifixion, it was time to celebrate the annual feast of first fruits. But this year, a harvest of even greater proportions issued forth. You see, it was on the first day after the Sabbath that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus was resurrected on the day of first fruits. This is not a coincidence. This didn't happen by accident. No, Jesus had a, a predetermined time to be born, to die, to be buried, and to be raised. And what was that God-appointed time? It was on the third day, on the exact time of the offering of the first fruits. You see, Jesus is the first fruits of the harvest that is to come. And what is that harvest? It's the resurrection of his people. Jesus is the first to rise, and we shall all rise with him. And if there's any doubt, Paul says it explicitly in our passage. So come back to 1 Corinthians. Let me just read the whole passage. You'll see how it fits together. If Christ has not been raised, I'm in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we have hope, in this life only, 
We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then verse 23, each in his own order. Christ the first fruit, then at his coming, those who belong to him. You see, just as the first fruits offered to God anticipated the fuller harvest to come, Christ's resurrection anticipated the harvest of his people that is still yet to come. His resurrection secures our faith, our forgiveness, and our future resurrection. His resurrection is a sure pledge of our resurrection, which means we can say with Job, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my skin is thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold and not another. There's a lot going on there. Let's step back and figure this out for a minute. Job, so many centuries earlier, says he has confidence in the resurrection. He says, I know the Redeemer lives. At the very last, he's gonna stand upon the earth. The Messiah who would come, he would die and he would rise But more than that, Job says, and I'm going to see him. But first he says, after my skin has thus been destroyed. He's talking about his body being decomposed. (laughs) He says, I'm going to lay in the grave. I'm going to turn to dust, but I will rise. And in my flesh, with my own eyes, I will look upon the Lord. I will see him. The whole Bible has been anticipating this moment. We can join with Job with that same confidence, knowing that indeed we will be raised to be with the Lord forever. The Lord's resurrection is proof positive that all who trust in him will be raised forever, raised to eternal life. In like manner, we will dwell with the Lord bodily in a new heavens and a new earth. Jesus indeed was raised on the third day in accordance with, with the scriptures. And one of the many ways that the scripture foretold this coming was the festival of first fruits. Christ is our first fruits. Which brings me to this. We have something to celebrate today. It is indeed a holiday that Christ is risen from the dead. But the truth is that celebration is really only for those who belong to Christ. Look again at verse 23. Don't miss this important word. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So, so the harvest that is going to come is all those who belong to Christ. Who, who, who is that? Who are those who belong to Christ? Well, the Bible makes it clear again and again. It's those who trust in him. It's those who turn away from their sin, who repent and believe. This is what Jesus was promising over and over and over again. So think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The promise of life that never ends is only to those who believe. So I encourage you this morning, make sure that you are among the number that belong to the Lord. Trust him. Believe in him. It's those who trust Christ who will be raised to life eternal. It's only those who have faith in Christ, who have been forgive, who've been forgiven through Christ, that later experience the future resurrection. You know, earlier I quoted from Romans 6, verse 23. I only quoted the first half of the verse. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is life unending, life eternal in a new glorified body available to all who believe, all who will receive this gift. Don't trust in your good works. Trust in Christ and in him alone. Christ is the first fruits of our resurrection who trust in him. So brothers and sisters, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Because he's risen from the dead, our faith is sure. Our hope cannot be taken from us. Because he's risen from the dead, our sins 
are forgiven. We've been declared righteous in his sight. Because he's risen from the dead, our future resurrection is sure. We too will be raised as he was raised. As Peter put it, this is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Because Christ is risen, we too shall rise. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are astounded at your mercy and your grace that sinners could be saved. That those who deserve to die shall be given life eternal. Lord, we thank you that our Savior is risen. And that because he has been risen, he has been raised, we too shall be raised like him to life without end. We pray all this in the name of Christ.